outstanding young people, their fu our future is bright. Our next speaker has had a truly distinguished Navy career, a native of Phoenix. He's an 86 graduate of the University of California at Berkeley. He holds master's degrees from Marine Corps University and the University of San Diego. He's also completed an executive fellowship at Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and was designated a naval aviator in 1987. He's held a number of sea duty assignments, including three deployments to Antarctica and three deployments to the Arabian Gulf. Ashore, he served on the Joint Staff at Commander Naval Air Force's U.S. Pacific Fleet with the European Command Staff in Stuttgart, Germany, and Chief of Staff to Commander Navy Region Southwest. As Executive Assistant to the Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Energy, Installations and Environment, and Commander of Naval Base Coronado. As a Flag Officer, he was the 89th Commandant of the Naval District Washington, Commander Navy Region Southwest, and Commander Navy Region Europe, Africa Central. Uh, he's also serving as the Commander of the Naval Installation Command since May 29, 2020. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Vice Admiral Jens, Yancey Lindsay. <laughs> hey, thanks so much. And man, you did a good job with that. All that to say, I've probably been in the Navy way too long. That's probably what that says. Now, if I fidget with my uniform a little bit up here this morning, will you kind of give me a break? Uh, I don't wear this uniform very often, uh, at least not lately. And uh, I don't know about you all, but the pandemic has not been very kind to my waistline. Uh, let's just put it this way. I permanently retired my skinny jeans, okay? I will not be wearing those anymore. But wow, what an honor to share the stage with such an American, uh, amazing uh, group of young people. In fact, as a Navy pilot, I feel like after I heard them speak and saw how polished they were, I feel like I lowered the average, average IQ of the uh, folks up here on the uh, platform significantly. So I'll try to struggle through with my remarks. They will not be as polished and as sharp and as poised as they were. I, if you don't know that the future of our country is in good hands and you missed the last about 20 or 30 minutes here, that is remarkable, both in uniform and the young ones that are coming up. So I'm in town, uh, my hometown. Does that mean I'm supposed to leave? No, okay. I thought maybe my time was up. Is that what they, the big hook comes out, they play the music, and now how the Academy Awards go? I don't know. Um, I'm in my hometown here for an executive engagement visit. The Navy does this periodically, sends uh, Navy, senior Navy leaders to, uh, to cities and communities that don't have a large Navy presence. And uh, last time I checked, there was no oceanfront property in Arizona and uh, no ships parked out here uh, along uh, Salt River. But it's a great opportunity to come out and mix it with uh, leaders of academia, uh, leaders of our government, and of business, and just talk about the Navy, what the Navy's doing, why the Navy's important, and just share the opportunity to, uh, to engage in those types of conversations. And I'm fortunate that it coincided with the American Legion National Convention, because what a pleasure to be surrounded uh, by amazingly patriotic Americans. Uh, can I come back next year? Is that, is that good? Man, I tell you what, this is amazing. Now we heard from California, because I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm from Phoenix, Arizona, but I've probably lived more of my life in that state. But we haven't heard from Arizona and there are hosts yet. Any Phoenicians or uh, Arizona folks? Okay, but whew, there for a minute I thought maybe I went to sleep last night and woke up in a different state, so good. Glad you're all here. It's also amazing to share the, uh, the stage with a true nation, one of our nation's true heroes, and Colonel Bruce Crandall, oh my gosh. I mean, the opportunity just to shake the hand of a Medal of Honor recipient is, uh, is a life experience, and uh, sir, you do us proud, and it's an honor just to be on the stage with you. Okay, uh, you know, I, I mentioned, I made a little joke of the pandemic, but I think it's important we remember that was very, it's been a very tragic uh, experience, and it's a serious disease. Uh, and so, it's, you know, I don't want us to lose track of that. And so, I think, I think our military's done pretty good through this uh, pandemic. In fact, I'm pretty proud of our Navy. 
Uh, your armed forces, really all the armed forces, have continued to operate, they've continued to deploy, they've continued to take our nation's business and do its bidding literally around the world in the face of a very challenging pandemic. So uh, I don't want to make light of it and make jokes of it because it is a serious disease, but I do want to say that I'm really proud of our Navy and what we've been able to do. And in fact, as we sit here in this beautiful auditorium, nice, cool auditorium, our Navy is deployed. Over 86 ships of our 296 ships are currently underway. Three carrier strike groups, the George H.W. Bush is off the East Coast, the USS Carl Vinson is off the West Coast, and USS Ronald Reagan is in the Naval Central, Com Navy, excuse me, U.S. Central Command area of uh, operation supporting, was supporting what was happening in Afghanistan and then taking care of other business there. And we have two amphibious readiness groups. The Iwo Jima is there where the Ronald Reagan is in Central Command. And the Essex is off the West Coast training. So with 86 ships underway, and that's of a total force of 296 ships, that's about the same number we would have underway at any point in time when we were a 600-ship Navy. So that just tells you how busy your Navy is, where it is, and what it's doing. Now, 35 years ago when I joined the Navy, I was just a knucklehead college student, not really knowing what I wanted to do. And military service was the farthest thing from my mind. But I was fortunate, and then I had some folks that advised me, hey, if you know, if you just go down, and I just went right down here, Monroe Street uh, school, school buildings, just literally around the corner here, went down the basement, it was a military entrance processing station, took some tests and they said, hey, you passed, you can go fly airplanes in the Navy. And I went, really? You gonna let me do that? I tell you what, what an adventure it's been. 35 years now and uh, I'm not looking back. In fact, I tell a lot of people, I got married along the way, as most of us do. Um, I tell people that my, I think my wife enjoys the Navy more than I do and that's probably why I stayed in 35 years. But what an adventure it's been, the places I've gone, the things I've seen, the good I've done, the, those that I've helped, literally around the world. But more importantly, what I've been able to represent, what I've been able to stand for as an American wearing this uniform to those literally around the world. Now don't let what you see on television and the media, and I don't think you do, this crowd doesn't, let it influence your judgment on what's happening or the importance of those who wear our uniform and the importance of their mission. And I'm going to talk about Afghanistan a little bit. It's been in the news. And I know many of you served there or you have a relative or a friend or a colleague who served there. Okay. Don't judge well, Afghanistan by what you've seen in the news and on television for the last couple weeks. Judge it by the work that's been done over the last 20 years. One day, one week, one month does not change the amazing difference we've made in that country, in the hearts of literally millions of people that otherwise would not have known what American is and what America stands for. Judge it by the lives we've changed changed, the freedoms we've protected, and the liberties that the Afghanistan people have enjoyed over those 20 years. Judge it by the millions who had the opportunity to live free. Judge it by the hundreds of thousands that are now leaving that country in search of a taste, in search of what they had a taste of over the last 20 years. Yeah, they're running from something, but they're also running to something, something we represent, something you represented, something we represent as Americans. Let's not forget that. Let's, not, let's judge them by parents who will hand their infant child over a barbed wire wall to complete strangers. What parents do that? I'll tell you what it is. It's parents that know and trust and believe in what those people wearing a uniform are standing for and why they're there. And I say all that because those of you that have served in our uniform, you made a difference, okay? 
and the people that were there in uniform on the ground in Kabul for the last two weeks made a difference. All right? We made a difference. Those 13 fallen service members who last Sunday came back to U.S. soil at Dover Air Force Base made a difference. That's how we'll honor their service. You honor them, American Legion, when you support them and their families, when you lift them up, and when you come alongside them to help them and to support them. American Legion support and advocacy gives meaning to our service. We stand on your shoulders, your shoulders. Those that went before us created a military that we now get to enjoy. We have a country that supports us in every way, shape, or form, that honors us, that respects what we do, those of us in uniform. It's because of what you did and the service that you contributed. And it's what you do now, after your service, in communities across our nation and literally around the world. Let's never forget that we had the privilege to wear this uniform and to represent our country and never forget the privilege of serving this amazing nation we get to call home. God bless our Navy, and God bless these United States of America. Thank you, American Legion. Appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. It's an honor.